You're welcome to come to the uh, piece of fabric that's here in front and uh, to pull the threads out. So there are um, tools and you can, sit, you can sit in a circle, like in one of the circles. You can bring your chair and sit there if you want. Um, the only thing I ask is for you to leave whatever thread you pull there. Um, I mean, you'll take some of it home on your clothes probably, but um, so if this is an interesting proposition, it's there for the taking. So it's, um, it has been a long day. It's been a, a, a remarkable day uh, for me anyway, so I'm, I'm um, thrilled by that. I wanted to say, before I introduce our final panel, I just wanted to say something really brief about, about Tina and my motivations for these art and the senses panels in general. Um, we were inspired by our shared interest in the urgency and political capacities of multi-sensory artistic practices. And since we were so inspired and so in interested, we looked to foster our own multi-sensory engagements with these artists and artist scholars um, that we have gathered here for you today. So this morning we had this really, um, for me, moving and beautiful interaction among Joselie's um, smell, vision smell interactions. Um, and Alex and uh, Alicia's responses, engagements with that lovely intersection, weird, lovely, uh, moving intersection. And we're, now we're moving into some other combinations of senses with um, Grisha's work first, which I have only, uh, which I uh, have gotten to know for um, over the last year and have been very inspired by, and I'm thrilled to have her here today. I'll say more about her in a moment. And, um, and then on to Aaron's uh, really unique combinations of art, practice, and theorizing, which, which are newer to me, and I'm very excited about um, getting the chance to engage with. Uh, and I love to, I'm happy to see that you're all down there already engaging. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, so I'm just gonna introduce everybody quickly. Um, and in order of, of uh, the, presentations. So first, Grisha Coleman works as a choreographer and composer in performance and experiential media, exploring relationships among our physiological, technological, and ecological systems. She currently holds the position of Associate Professor of Movement, Computation, and Digital Media in the School of the Arts, Media, and Engineering, and the School of Dance at Arizona State University. Her recent art and scholarly work, Echo System. I tried to give a pause for the two um, pieces of punctuation. <laughs> Echo, breath, breath system uh, is a springboard for reimagining the environment, environmental change, and environmental justice. Erin Manning holds a university research chair in relational art and philosophy in the Faculty of, the fine, of fine Arts at Concordia University in Montreal. She is also the director of the Sense Lab. There, the two words are, are forced together, so there's no pause. Um, <laughs> Sense Lab. Um, a laboratory that explores the intersection between art practice and philosophy through the matrix of the sensing body in movement. Current art projects are focused around the concept of minor gestures in relation to color and movement. And she has published widely and eclectically, really impressively, widely, and eclectically, most recently a book called The Minor Gesture. Victoria Wool is a dear friend and colleague of mine and a professor of classics at the University of Toronto. She works on literature and culture, in class, the literature and culture of classical Athens, focusing especially on the intersection among three fields, the social, the political, and the psychic, and the role of literature in articulating and negotiating their interaction. She is the author of numerous influential books and articles, including most recently an innovative study on aesthetics and politics in Greek tragedy entitled Euripides and the Politics of Form. Um, please help me welcome these three.
The Myth of the Infinite Walk. Once there was a species of city dwellers, desert dwellers living in an urban place that used to be a desert not so very long ago. The city had transformed rapidly over the recent past, and amongst a few of them who lived there persisted a vague feeling of discontent. So they decided to leave to go out beyond the boundaries of the city as their nomadic ancestors had before them, into the desert. Their species believed that crossing the desert was key to remembering what they had forgotten through time and an accumulation of unconsidered decisions. The story of how the drone bones came to be known as the Gila Mud Men is a mysterious one. A migration to a new habitat was to take five days across the desert. Some say it took 40 years. Some say the journey is not yet complete. Some say the ear in the sky masked its frequencies from them because they were obstinate and wouldn't listen. These are the known facts. The mudman appears not to move in space, for he is a nomad. He turns left. He turns right and spreads his territory beneath his feet, for this desert is in a constant metamorphic flux, thus giving rise to the saying, like mudmen on treadmills. She turns left. She turns right and spreads her territory beneath her feet, thus giving rise to the saying, like mudmen on treadmills. This infinite walk, this vision quest, would ensure the successful evolution of their species. Or so they thought. The desert, vast, extreme, illusory, they imagined this journey could provide the insight necessary to guide them out of their disconsolate state. This unbounded place of 360 degree horizons would allow our tribe to walk without stopping. But the general inhabitants of this city in the desert were not accustomed to walking. Current theory held that this species still retained vestigial impulses of their predecessors to walk and to run. Yet in recent years, they had developed the treadmill to satisfy this evolutionary impulse. Therefore, only at a gym, on a treadmill, could one understand the sensation of moving without traveling, the feeling of walking, yet going nowhere as our well-intentioned tribe proceeded with their plans to depart, they carried with them their assumptions and their tools. The belief that the treadmill was necessary to create infinity. Upon departure, each one carried a treadmill on their back, out back to the interior of this vast desert landscape, commencing their infinite walk not all by the moving ended up as mud men. A divergent species known as suits also emerge. The story goes that there was a rift in consciousness. One drone had a revelation. All deserts are the same. The drone's existing was not limited to salt flats, but they were in abandoned parking lots. They were on Mars. And there were other ancient clues, other sacred skateboarders, the ear in the sky, she claimed the ear was transmitting messages to her. She was stripped of her feathers and outcast. For a moment, as she walked through the sweltering horizons of the salt flats, she appeared to change. She was wearing something the mudmen instinctively understood to be a suit. There was panic, 
supposing she was right about this other dimension. They were warned not to look back at the dissident, yet the more they look, the more they see. Is it one dreamer refracted into thousands, or is it really an army of suits flopping on the desert horizon? Is this a departure or an arrival? Perpetually waving on the horizon, suits appear to be going nowhere. In Treadmill Dreamtime Running in Place, our fictional tribe seeks seeking knowledge of the future of their species interface with the land via the treadmill in their version of a modern walkabout. Yet while searching for clues on how to live more gracefully ear, and comprehensively with their, in their desert environment, they are caught in a paradox of walking without traveling. Something else is playing. I don't know what it is. I'm just going to let it play. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> it, this machine. OK. Um, <clears throat> they're caught in a paradox of walking without traveling and come to realize that they have an inadequate understanding of their relationship to the land they traverse, the knowledge of their past, uh, and its connection to their present state. The choreographic narrative describes an emotional landscape of misunderstandings that seek expression but find no resolution. As they run towards their future on treadmills, images of contemporary progress are thrown into paradoxical relief. So you were watching uh, just then an excerpt of a video, a video documentation from a performance of what was then called Action Station to the Desert that was produced um, in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon through the Studio for Creative Inquiry. And this is like one small iteration in a bigger piece, a project, serial project titled um, Ecosystem that Nancy was talking about, um, which like we can broadly describe as a fusion of participatory installation, choreographed multimedia performance, and public engagement. Um, Ecosystem is imagined as a series of five large-scale environment events, each corresponding to a natural habitat, a natural habitat. I mean, all of this, like, I could, I could just stand here with quotations after the last panel, but you would just have to put your own quotations in. Um, so an abyss, a desert, a forest, prairie, and volcano. Collectively, these works are called action stations, uh, and they're constructed using myth, time, scale, and ecologies to inform their creation in a tradition of speculative fiction. So developing this work requires both the negotiation of a variety of disciplinary perspectives um, and knowledge from a variety of sources, arts, ecology, ethnography, computation, literature. Um, ecosystem looks to both denature and reinvigorate how we place ourselves in places, in space, spaces of myth and darkness within virtual layers of information to access, assess, and challenge the proliferation of knowledge around the environment as we try to use it and save it simultaneously. So I'm going to, you saw just previously to this, you saw this uh, sketch. This was an early sketch of, of treadmill interface that we were developing. And um, because after working on it as a piece of performance, because my background is more, more, much more so in, in, in live art, uh, I, I wanted to ask this question about um, embodiment and physical engagement as a way to, um, to translate something about uh, ecologies and our, our relation to the environment. Um, so the treadmill, acts not only as a metaphorical prop through which the performance plays out, but it also offers the individual public, and this is what you're seeing here, an opportunity to take one's own mediated walk separate from the performance event. 
Um, these augmented machines extend the metaphor of an interface with the land in that they activate a, a kind of meditative and a sensory experience. And I just want to show you a little bit from the, um, from the work, I see, I, I see what's going on, from the work that was just performed in uh, San Francisco at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in April. So you can get a sense of what that was doing. So in this case, multiple augmented treadmills were open to the public in advance of the performance, allowing walks on smart treadmills, not so smart, but smart enough, smarter, through desert regions in the Sonoran Southwest. Um, and all of these walks had a kind of a cycle of, had a, had a theme of going from an urban area to a, to a natural area. And um, er, yeah, so, so in this imagination of treadmills being functional replacements for walking on the earth, um, the human-machine interaction um, emphasized this idea of the, of the surroundings as the immersive medium in which we interact. Um, I've always been struck by the irony embedded in the use of mechanically assisted walking machines, so our myth recasts the commonplace activity of working out as a surreal journey. Symbolically, uh, this activity also raises issues of energy expenditure that's, and now it's going into performance mode, that's okay. Um, any energy expenditure that is no longer linked to hunting, farming, fleeing, or even moving towards one's destination. Um, so because, I'm just gonna do this kind of overview because there are lots of aspects to the project and it's been, been being worked on by a number of different people uh, and this, this collaborative transdisciplinary team for, for a while. Um, there's the, the issue, because this is haps, haptics, uh, the issue maybe of human-centered computing or HCI is of interest to, to you all. Um, and there's one, uh, the, the author, the, the HCI um, scholar, Paul Dorish, emphasized the study of embodiment to guide and expand the domain of computational design, um, which, you know, typically, if you're working on computation, you're not thinking about, you, for one thing, you're not thinking about your body, let alone, you know, you might be thinking about the ergonomics of other people's bodies, but in order to sell them something. So that's kind of different. Um, in his book, Where the Action Is, he writes, physically, our experiences cannot be separated from the reality of our bodily presence in the world, and socially, too. The same relationship holds because our nature as social beings is based on the ways in which we act and interact in real time all the time. So acknowledgement and activation of the body in movement towards a more comprehensive understanding is central to this work. Um, the late biologist and neuroscientist Francesco Varela inspired by the phenomenology of Merleau-Ponty, described the assumption of a disembodied observer or of a disworlded mind, explaining that the embodiment of knowledge, cognition, and experience is, encompasses both the body as lived experiential structure and the body as the context or milieu of cognitive mechanisms. Um, This one, okay. See a little bit about uh, some of the process of, of the, <clears throat> the dancers who I've been working with. Um, and this, uh, you know, it's, there's one thing to talk about embodiment and dancers are sort of like the top top in, in, in practicing it. What does it mean to practice it? Um, Ecosystem I was, is, uh, sorry, aware. let me take another one, thanks. Um, I was speaking uh, with Victoria about this idea of uh, somatic education, um, which is sort of a, a, a realm that lives between a kind of therapeutic realm and an, and an arts practice realm. So 
uh, somatic issues of orientation, gravitation, friction, and timing, and the complex coordination of these elements in navigating our environment impact our perceptual experience and therefore the way we make meaning. Uh, cybernetics historian Catherine Hales and Catherine Hale speaks of her dream of a version of the post-human that understands that life is human life, or not, okay, is embedded in a material world of great complexity, one on which we depend on for our continued survival. Um, F.M. Alexander, who was one of the pioneers of, of this in the West, in, of this uh, uh, methods of, of somatic research um, in the field in the early 1900s, uh, he began to reframe the notion of cognition as external to the movement of the body. In his seminal work, The Use, the Use of Self, he writes that the so-called mental and physical are not separate entities, that, the, that for this reason human ills and shortcomings cannot be classified as mental or physical, but must be based upon the indivisible hum unity of the human organism. Um, so this premise that the environmental issues are inherently related to issues of our own survival kind of justified the reason why I would make a project that, had, that was driven by dance, uh, uh, dance or movement that you would be able to reflect and observe upon in the performance, but also experience yourself uh, so you you know you could kind of uh, see if this other way of understanding or looking at uh, the idea of the external environment made made a difference. Um, I'll I'll just wrap up by saying um, this is a piece that was done uh, with movement of the of the mo motion capture data gathered from the dancers and then reanimated um, to, to work on these visualizations of, of the environment of this, in this case, the desert environment, um, not so much as a, what we might uh, usually think of as data visualization or information visualization, but as something much more aestheticized, much more, um, um, looking towards the organic even in even in the digital um, <clears throat> so this idea of the transformation of information to knowledge to action through imagining alternatives not just to what your facts are or what your information is but how the information is delivered so conventional paths for media information delivery internet television radio print news can complicate notions of collective responsibility or worse, instill a sense of individual futility in affecting complex processes that impact our lives and the planet. Although social media networks provide intense and unprecedented access to and manipulation of information, how this actually translates into choices and behavioral shifts on the ground is not at all clear. Um, I, I was also asking a question embedded in this is this question of how time-based art might play a critical role in the integration of abstract information and complex current events with our everyday lives through tangible, aesthetic, real-time experiences. Live performance, and particularly dance, emphasizes knowledge based in the present physical moment, and expressing these moments in time through the body is one of the strongest aspects of this form. Um, Live art, when framed as a form of contemporary ritual, can provide a different sense of collective reflection. You can bring it up a little bit. It's just music now. Um, thanks. Um, with the potential to play a critical role in the integration of current events with our everyday lived experience by reinstating the very materiality that Hales discusses. Ecosystem constructs symbiotic experiences for the public digital physical hybrids common to our contemporary exp experiences yet co recombined in novel ways. The power of dance to communicate a sensory experience can harness the power and function of ritual to provide a sense of collective reflection. The project affords multiple angles and perspectives on our relationship to the environment, offering a potential to synthesize a more coherent, holistic, and interdependent viewpoint. And just, I wanna finish with um, a quote from Andre Lepecki, who's a uh, really, prominent dance scholar down at NYU. Um, Andrew Lepecki is looking at ideas of choreopolitics and choreopolicing, and 
he's, he, in looking at the writing of uh, Hannah Arndt, he commented, Arndt's diagnostic that we do not know, at least not yet, how to move politically can also be written without losing any accuracy as we do not know, at least not yet, how to move freely. The loss of knowing how to move politically results in, as much as procedures, the loss of being able to find sense, meaning, and orientation in moving freely. So, thank you. I want to thank you, Tina and Nancy, for um, making this possible. I knew this would be a very special event, which is why I came, despite having just flown back from India. Um, and it truly has been exquisite and such extraordinary quality of, not only of thought, but also uh, generosity. So I, I really want to thank you for that. Um, when I was invited, I, I imagined not talking at all. Um, I'm, I'm in, a, in a space where I wonder um, what it is that we can't hear. Uh, it's something that's a lot on my mind, what it is that's so far outside our ways of being in the world that we don't even know how to know it. And, um, and in the p current political climate, I often wonder whether um, we don't have to become sensitive, or at least I, I don't have to become sensitive to those rhythms that I don't know even how to feel. But everybody's been talking all day, so I got um, intimidated, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk. Uh, <laughs> um, but hopefully it'll make a little bit of sense when I, when I originally imagined that we might spend an hour just pulling thread. I've spent the last uh, year and a half um, pulling threads out of fabric. The minor gesture in 16 movements. One, a definition. The minor gesture the gestural force that opens experience to its potential variation, moving from within experience itself, activating a shift in tone, a difference in quality. Two, a proposition. A minor key is always interlaced with major keys. The minor works the major from within. What must be remembered is this, neither the minor nor the major are fixed in advance. The major is a structural tendency that organizes itself according to predetermined definitions of value. The minor is a force that courses through it, unmooring its structural integrity, problematizing its normative standards. The unwavering belief in the major as the site where events occur where events make a difference is based on accepted accounts of what registers as change, as well as existing parameters for gauging the value of that change. Yet, while the grand gestures of a macropolitics most easily sum up the changes that occurred to alter the field, it is the minor minoritarian tendencies that initiate the subtle shifts that created the conditions for this and any change. The grand is given the status it has not because it is where the transformative power lies, but because it is easier to identify major shifts than it is to catalog the nuanced rhythms of the minor. As a result, these rhythms are narrated as secondary or even negligible. Three, how does it move? The minor is a continual variation on experience. It has mobility not given to the major. Its rhythms are not controlled by a pre-existing structure, but open to flux. In variation is in change, indeterminate. But indeterminacy, because of its wildness, is often seen as unrigorous, flimsy, its lack of solidity mistaken for a lack of consistency. The minor thus gets cast aside, overlooked, or forgotten in the interplay of major chords. This is the downside of the minor, but also its strength that it does not have the full force of a pre-existing status, of a given structure, of a predetermined metric to keep it alive. It is out of time, untimely, 
rhythmically inventing its own pulse. Four, what makes it known? The minor isn't known in advance. It never reproduces itself in its own image. Each minor gesture is singularly connected to the event at hand, imminent to the inact. The event is here defined according to Alfred North Whitehead's concept of the actual occasion. Actual occasions are the coming into being of indeterminacy where potentiality passes into realization. The minor gesture is active in this indeterminate phase of the event, acting as the vehicle of potential punctuation of the event. Indeterminacy and punctuation are always in co-composition. The minor gesture makes felt not an infinitely open account of process, but process punctuated. The event and the minor gesture are always in co-composition, the minor gesture moving the welling event in new and divergent directions that alter the orientation of where the event might otherwise have settled. In this sense, the minor gesture is both punctuating and more than, always an excess of the events coming to form. If its punctuality is understood as its pragmatic share, we might say this quality of the more than is its speculative share. In the mode of speculative pragmatism, the minor gesture invents its own value, a value as ephemeral as it is mobile. This permeability tends to make it ungraspable and often unrecognizable. It is no doubt difficult to value that which has little perceptible form, that which has not yet quite been invented let alone defined. And so the minor gesture often goes by unperceived, its improvisational threads of variability overlooked, despite their being in our midst. There is no question that the minor is precarious. And yet the minor gesture is everywhere, all of the time. Despite its precarity, it resurfaces punctually, claiming not space as such, but space of variation. The minor invents new forms of existence and with them, in them, we come to be. These temporary forms of life travel across the everyday, making untimely existing political structures, activating new modes of perception, inventing languages that speak in the interstices of major tongues. Five, at the margins, the minor gesture is not the figure of the marginal, though the marginal may carry a special affinity for the minor and wish to compose with it. Gilles Deleuze writes, it is not the marginal who creates the lines. They install themselves on these lines and make them their property. And this is fine when they have that strange modesty of people of the line, the prudence of the experimenter but it is a disaster when they slip into a black hole from which they no longer utter anything but the micro-fascist speech of their dependency and their giddiness. We are the avant-garde. We are the marginal." End quote. The minor gesture is the force that makes the lines tremble that compose the everyday, the lines both structural and fragmentary that articulate how else experience can come to expression. To compose with the minor gesture requires, as Deleuze cautions, the prudence of the experimenter. A prudence awake to the speculative pragmatism at the heart of the welling event. Create techniques for experimental prudence, a prudence patient enough to engage with that which experimentation unsettles. A prudence attuned to the force of the inact. But beware. This is not the prudence of a passive outlier. This is a tentativeness in the act that jumps at the chance to discover what else the event can do. It is a prudence that composes at the edges of the as yet unthought in the rhythm of the minor gesture. Six, how is it a gesture? The minor is here a gesture in the sense that it is the activator, the carrier, the agencement that draws the event into itself. 
It is the forward force capable of carrying the affective tonality of non-conscious resonance and moving it toward the articulation, edging into consciousness of new modes of existence. Seven, a politics of the minor. In its punctual reorienting of the event, the minor gesture invents new modes of life living. It moves through the event, creating a pulse, opening the way for new tendencies to emerge. And in the resonances that are awakened, potential for difference looms. A politics of the minor might be defined this way. The movement activated in the event by a difference in register that awakens new modes of encounter and creates new forms of life living. Life living in its usage here refuses to privilege this life, this human life, at the expense of different forms and forces of life, even as it recognizes the importance of the punctuality of this singular event we call our life. Life living is a way of thinking life with and beyond the human, Thinking life as more than human. Deleuze's concept of a life resonates strongly here, a life defined in his last ode to living as the flux of liveliness coursing through existence unlimited. The conjunction between the minor gesture and life living is a political ecology that operates on the level of the inact, act, asking at every junction what else life could be how this singular life orientation carries existence and where its minor gestures may lead is always, for me, a political question. Eight, what of art? I propose we work with the medieval definition of art as way, as manner or mode. Art as way is not yet about an object, about a form or a content. It is still on its way. As such, it is deeply allied to Bergson's definition of intuition as the art or the manner in which the very conditions of experience are felt. Intuition, as Bergson defines it, both sets a process on its way and acts as the decisive turn within experience that activates a productive opening within time's durational folds. Intuition crafts the operative problem. In its feeling forth a future potential, intuition touches the sensitive nerve of time. Yet intuition is not time or duration per se. Intuition, Deleuze writes, is rather the movement by which we emerge from our own duration, by which we make use of our own duration to affirm and immediately to recognize the existence of other durations. Intuition is the relational movement through which the present begins to coexist with its futurity, with the quality or manner of the not yet that lurks at the edges of experience. This, I want to propose, is art. The intuitive potential to activate the future in the specious present, to make the middling of experience felt where futurity and presentness coincide, to invoke the memory not of what was, but of what will be, art, the memory of the future. Nine, the art of time. For Whitehead, all experience is in act, variously commingling with the limits of the not yet and the will have been. Experience is in movement. When art is defined as object, as form, we are faced with a paradox. For there to be a theory of the object, the object has to be conceived as out of time, relegated beyond experience, unchanging. Yet in experience, what we call an object is always, to some degree, not yet, in process, in movement. In the midst, in the event, we know the object not in its fullness, in its ultimate form, but as an edging into experience. Form is always held to a certain degree in abeyance. That the object does not ultimately settle once and for all in experience does not mean that the form we know as a given object, a chair, a painting, a ball, is contained in an unreachable elsewhere. The object is the abeyance, the feeling form 
a form felt more than actualized, that cannot be separated out from the milieu, from the field that it co-activates. In the case of the chair, something like the ecology of comfort, sitability, and desire to sit. Whether the desire to sit errs on the edge of sitability or leans toward plushness of comfort, the experience of chair is never a finite one. It is never contained by the dimensions of the object or the subject itself. The object, like the subject, is never itself. Art can make this more than of the object felt. This happens through art's capacity to bring event time to expression. This crafting of the art of time involves the activation of time's differential. This activation of the dynamic difference in the event between what was and what will be creates a memory of the future. When art is at its most operational, this tendency does not settle in what we call the object. It moves across it, pushing the now of experience in the making to its limit. Here, in the uneasy opening between now and now, art's manner is felt. 10. Artfulness. Raymond Rière speaks of aesthetic yield. What kind of yield does the abeyance of form propose? What is the art of this yield? This I call artfulness. Artfulness is the operative expression of worlds in the making, the aesthetic yield that opens experience to the trans-individual quality of the more than. Artfulness is an imminent directionality felt when a process now in the form of an object continues to activate its most sensitive fold, a fold still rife with intuition. Artfulness is beyond the human. Art as mode, as manner, as way is not ours to own. Certainly it cuts through, merges with, captures and dances with the human but it is also and always more than human. To touch on the artful is to touch on the incommensurable more than that is everywhere active in the ecologies that make us and exceed us. 11, emergent collectivity. Tweaked toward the artful in the process of making, art becomes a way toward an ethos of trans-individuation. From the most apparently stable structure to the most mobile or ephemeral process, art, is, art that is artful activates the art of participation, making felt the trans-individual force of an event time that catapults the human into our difference. This difference, the more than at our core, the non-human share that animates our every cell becomes attentive to the relational field that opens the work to its intensive outside. This relational field must not be spatially understood. It is an intensive mattering, an absolute mobility that inhabits the work durationally. It is the art of time making itself felt. A fielding of difference has been activated and this must be tended. The art of participation involves creating the conditions for this tending to take place. This tending is first and foremost a tending of the fragile environment of duration generated by the working of the work and activated by the minor gesture, a tending of the work's incipient rhythms. 12, beyond value? Artfulness has no use value. It does nothing that can be mapped onto a process already underway. It has no end point, no preordained limits, no moral codes. But it is conditioning. To say that a process is conditioning is to say that the enabling constraints of its emergence continue to facilitate a propitious engagement with the problem at hand, enabling the passage toward a field that yields. A practice does its work when this yield, already present in germ in the initial pro problem that, activates, that activated its process, in the intuition that oriented it, is made operational by a minor gesture. Without propitious conditions, the aesthetic does not yield. 
Propitious conditions facilitate contemplation. Contemplation understood as the act of lingering with, of tending to a process, is a minor form of doing. It attends to the conditions of the work's work. Contemplation is passive only in the sense that this attending provokes a waiting, a stilling, a listening, a sympathy with. This sympathy is enveloped in the process, sympathetic to the ineffable share of experience emboldened by the minor gesture, attuned to the fragile art of time. Contemplation, operative at the edges of perception where the conscious and the non-conscious overlap, activates times of its own making. For contemplation, like intuition, activates the differential of an event and in so doing becomes responsive to the subtle nuances of experience crafting itself. Contemplation makes the artful felt. It does so in the event, in the uneasy balance between seeding a practice and becoming with a practice. Here in the midst of life living, artfulness reminds us that the I is not where life begins and the you is not what makes it art. Made up as it is of a thousand contemplations, the art of time reminds us, as Deleuze writes, that, quote, we must speak of the self only in virtue of these thousands of little witnesses which contemplate within us. It is always a third party who says me, end quote. This is why artfulness is more rare than art. Artfulness, the way the art of time makes itself felt, how it lands, and how it always exceeds its landing. 13, a diagram for life living. Alternative diagrams for life living must resist returning to a model of inside-outside, where the human subject is situated as the motivator of experience. This is our habit, to make the work about us. When we do so, we set up conditions that are only generative as regards what we perceive as our own well-being. Framing our approach to the political this way, we place the subject, the human, in the position of agency, promoting the act in terms of the volitional thrust of our own intentionality. Even when we give voice to those silenced, even when we speak in the name of the multitude, even when we talk about the agency of an artistic process, even when we try to give agency to an oppressed people, we assume a mediation between an act and its unfolding. What if the act did not belong fully to us? 14, when movement exceeds us. Minor gestures are not ours to craft. It is what the minor does within the field of experience that makes its gesture felt. In the field of art, the artwork, the object, or even the effect created by an ephemeral composition is not in itself a minor gesture. The minor gesture is what activates the work under precise conditions, what makes the attunements of an emerging ecology felt, what makes the work work. The minor gesture's movement is decisional more than it is volitional. Decision defined here not as external to the event, but as the cut in the event through which new ecologies, new fields of relation are crafted. Non-conscious movement is decisional in the sense that it is capable of altering the course of the event in the event. Elsewhere, I've called the attunement in the event toward decisional movement choreographic thinking emphasizing the ability of movement to cue and align in space times of composition in ways that open experience to new registers. Decision is not what happens after the effective opening of the event to its potential, but what cleaves the event in the event. The minor gesture is a decisional cut. 15, a minor freedom. Minor gestures recast the field, making felt its differential. They do so by activating in the event a change in direction, a change in quality. The activation of a change in quality is what Bergson defines as freedom. 
Freedom is here not linked to human volition or agency. Freedom is instead allied to the inact, to the decisional force of movement moving, to the agencement that opens the event to the fullness of its potential. Freedom is how the event expresses its complexity in the event. Freedom for Bergson is dynamic, ecological. Freedom is a quality of the act, an ethos in the act's opening onto experience. Not all events are free, but in every event we find the germs of freedom. These germs must be tended, must be sown in ways that allow the act to create problems that will in turn generate modes of action, of activity, of activism that create new modes of existence. The minor gesture tends the germs of experience in forming, opening the act to its potential. In this sense, the minor gesture is a force for freedom. For the gesture is only a minor gesture insofar as it opens the way, insofar as it creates the conditions for a different ecology of time, space, of politics. The minor gesture, we must remember, is defined by its capacity to vary, not to hold not to contain. It acts on, moves through, its gesturing always toward a futurity present in the act, but as yet unexpressed. This is its force. This is its call for freedom. Freedom may not be a wor word to hold on to, given the weight of its history and its regular misuse. For now, I use it as a placeholder to remind us that human volition and freedom need not be thought of as complementary. We need not be at the center of our freedom. As Bergson writes, the process of our free activity goes on, as it were, unknown to ourselves in the obscure depths of our consciousness at every moment of duration. The heterogeneity of the non-continuous nature of experience is certainly not easy to articulate, but it is rich to hear it it is necessary to refrain from setting experience apart from the inact. 16, here, now. So much is left to say at the interstices of what has been composed and what is still on the verge. Here, now, in this transversal exploration of what a minor gesture can do, and I would say that that's what we've heard for the, the last day and a half, is, is a, an extraordinary complexity of minor gestures. The pragmatically speculative shares the space of inquiry, a few thoughts. Artfulness lives in these interstices that so often remain on the edges of what is recognized as art. For art tends in the neoliberal climate to be valued as the surplus, the newest new, the differently different. Minor gestures are not of this register. They activate the force of what is already in germ. Threadways, which is the work that's being worked, is an attempt to inquire into the pulse of the object's abeyance, the constraint that moves the work to pull threads until the fabric begins to lose its integrity, begins to become more or less itself, to ask what else is at stake in the material, how else it can be perceived, felt, to ask what other movements are in it, of it. In the end, an object, a constraint, a proposition, a work, and always a question. Will the work activate a minor gesture for its outdoing? One of the very, very few perks of speaking last at the end of a long day is that it's my privilege to invite you to join me in thanking Nancy and Tina for an extremely stimulating and exciting day. And if you haven't had a chance to come pull threads yet and you're um, thread curious, I invite you to come do that while I'm talking. It's incredibly fun. Okay, shadow time. The Bureau of Linguistic Reality defines shadow time as, quote, a parallel time scale that follows one around throughout day-to-day -day experience of regular time. 
shadow time manifests as a feeling of living in two distinctly different temporal scales simultaneously, or acute consciousness of the possibility that the near future will be drastically different than the present. One might experience shadow time while focused on goal-oriented conversations, tasks, and planning for life as we've known it, college, career, or occupational ambitions. During such moments, there's a creeping sense of concern that would make all said planning obsolete or unimportant, i.e. the collapse of the Larsen B ice shelf that will accelerate sea level rise. Shadow time may also occur when one is preparing a meal for their child and suddenly realizes that an endemic flower that had evolved over 42.7 million years has gone extinct within their child's lifetime, end quote. The concept of shadow time speaks to the difficulty we humans have in thinking in ecological time. As we face the apparent waning of the Anthropocene, we've been forced to confront this cosmic time frame, but we seem to be constitutionally incapable and or institutionally unwilling to fully grasp it, a failure with potentially disastrous consequences. But maybe what we cannot grasp conceptually, we can think haptically or kinesthetically. If, as Maurice Mer Merleau-Ponty writes, one must, quote, feel in some way in order to think, and every thought known to us occurs to a flesh, uh, end quote, perhaps our bodies are already thinking in shadow time, and our minds just need to catch up. This is the gambit of Aaron and Grisha's work. For both of them, the body's movement in space and through space is not only an exploration of our relation to our physical environment, but also an experience of our being in time. Walking the treadmill, pulling threads, in these everyday bodily acts, time becomes tangible. We can feel time both as abstract concept and as urgent historical moment, this time. This time is, for both artists, characterized by a certain stuckness, a sense of being enmeshed in a web of our own making that we don't fully understand, walking without traveling, as Grisha puts it. Both reflect movingly on the embodied affect of the present moment and how we might unbind ourselves and reweave ourselves to the world, how we might get moving, even if that motion gets us nowhere. Emphasizing process over product, both show us the value of errancy, wandering without an, a destination, and of biding our time. Grisha's daydream, uh, dream time encourages us to think mythically. Her metaphor of running in place recalls Sisyphus, I'm a classicist, sorry, pushing his own version of a treadmill up the hill, expending energy, but never reaching a goal. But for Grisha, walking in place is not an experience of futility, or not just an experience of futility, but a way of exploring and interacting with our envi uh, environment, becoming immersed in it through our durational experience of it. It's an experience of uncertainty, marked at times by tedium, frustration, and despair, but also by wonder and joy. In this way, her treadmills remind me more of Sisyphus's grandson, Odysseus, mythology's most famous wanderer. Unlike Grisha's tribe or treadmillers, Odysseus was moving towards a known goal, home. But that goal becomes less clearly known in the course of his journey toward it. His 10-year walkabout in dream time makes home itself a dream. His travels toward it often take the form of errancy, wandering off course, getting lost, doubling back, or staying put. For much of the poem, he is metaphorically and sometimes literally treading water. But this errancy allows him to interact with his world in ways that poor Sisyphus never could. Moving slower than he'd like, he feels his way through his environment with uncertainty and resourcefulness. Along the way, much enduring Odysseus learns the art of duration and its pleasure. After all, among his errors is the decade he spends stuck on the enchanted island of the enchanting nymph, Calypso. His wanderings are a bodily lesson in living on and living in, and they teach that there's a joy to traveling 
that ends when we arrive. Getting there is more than half the fun. Meanwhile, back at home, Penelope waits for him, weaving and unweaving. Aaron's threadways offers us, a th uh, offers us thread pulling as a minor gesture of perception of our being in space and time. Movement for Aaron, as for Grisha, is non-teleological, a matter of process, not product, and a process that proceeds through subtraction as much as addition. Unmaking then becomes a form of making, an unbinding of old connections and creation of new interlacings. Entrelace, interlacings, is Merleau-Ponty's word for the sensory entwinements that connect us as intelligent bodies to the flesh of the world. These same threads, as Aaron shows, enmesh us in the, time, in the tissue of time, not the timelessness of the finished object, but the elastic, nonlinear duration of artistic practice. As Aaron beautifully puts it in her book, The Minor Gesture, quote, a feltness in the event of a tendency. And I think uh, those of you who are pulling threads are feeling that feltness. Uh, the how of time as it co-composes with experience in the making, Aaron's words. No one knew more about the art of time than Penelope. Stuck in place, she is also stuck in time. She is time personified as her aging flesh registers the passing years of Odysseus's absence. Cicero likened time to the unraveling of a thread. But Penelope did what um, you guys are doing now. She grabs the thread of time and pulls. Like Aaron, she discovers the art of subtraction, an ethos of duration, in Aaron's words, that revels in unraveling. Penelope famously put off the suitors by saying she could not marry until she had finished weaving a death shroud for her father-in-law. What she weaves during the day, she unweaves every night, and so past three, four years. Weaving and unweaving, Penelope becomes a kind of timepiece. She measures time's passing, but also slows it down. Cheating time of its telos, the finished object, marriage, death, she endures by subtracting. That endurance, that experience of duration, is her glory, her kleos, as the suitors say, and also her pleasure. Telemachus figures her deception as a seduction holding out hope to the suitors to keep their desire alive. In the chiasm of Penelope's threading and unthreading, as in Aaron's threadways, time becomes tangible, not just as an abstract idea, but as a tissue that enmeshes and sustains us. As Merleau-Ponty writes, a possibility, a latency, and a flesh of things. Both Grisha and Aaron show us new ways of being in this shadow time in which we live and of thinking ecological time corporeally, even if we can't yet think it intellectually. They teach us the ethos of duration that governs the reciprocal relations between the sentient and the sensible, the subject and the world, and let us feel the pleasure of running in place. Both advise taking our time. Don't be a single-minded Sisyphus, but an Odysseus, finding wonder in wanderings, in no real rush to get home. Both encourage us to move collectively. Taking time means giving time and sharing time, an extended being together that reminds us of the threads that bind us. Centrelacé also means to hug one another. Finally, both encourage us to take the risk of not getting anywhere. The risk, as Penelope puts it, of losing our threads for nothing, or in Grisha's words, of walking without traveling. Treading mills or treading water may not get us home, but maybe it's a way of already being home. It's a way of dreaming time with our bodies, always slowly and together. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Thank you, um, both, both uh, artists for your presentations um, and your uh, um, embodied uh, actions. And um, I, Victoria, I have to say, I'm, I'm really intrigued by the idea of Grisha as Odysseus and Aaron as Penelope. <laughs> that, 
just kills me. <laughs> it's re I think that's a really good place to start for the two, for for you two to start a conversation. Um, and I also want, was thinking, sitting there thinking that it's um, the the minor gesture is so puzzling to think about in relation to Grisha's work because there is something minor in in walking in that that just that slight when people just start and, and then what you showed us mm -hmm. that slow repetitive tiny gesture and yet walking gets you everywhere yeah. right so i don't know i was puzzling my way around that as a place to start well mm -hmm. okay should i sure this? yeah and then we'll uh, um, open the floor can you guys hear me or should i Oh, we're recording it. Okay. So, um, I guess I was walking is 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 such a a beautiful movement to deal with, and in a kind of postmodern dance world, it's a, it's like it is the bread and butter of, of everything because um, it's very complicated. Walking is gesture it's really hard and people oh sorry thank you and people well <laughs> and people um don't think about it because it becomes um you know but at a certain point like at that point you're you're learning how to do it and once you learn how to do it it becomes autonomic but in the learning how to do it you realize the big uh the big chasms of it and um I guess that be making it um, conscious, like making it really explicit, was part of what I wanted to work with because I thought that, um, and also d theme and variation of walking and like continuing to derive the movement that is, that sort of, is all the potential movements, like the quantum movement of walking, do you know what I mean? That, that, that exists, although we don't do it all the time, we don't see it all the time, but it, it's, it's, it's there, <laughs> you know, it's there in the shadow. So, that, yeah, that's, what I, that's why I, I like um, walking, I, that's how I was thinking about it. So I have a 25 year practice of walking. <laughs> I'm, so my, all my work has been around walking. So for me, or my other work, my dance work, and, um, and I really felt that there was such a strength in your work in that way. And my feeling is that the more you focus on walking, the more you learn about how hard walking is. And what you learn is that it's actually full of complexity. And um, y you know this really well if you live in the north and you have to learn how to walk on ice every year. <laughs> and, uh, and it's remarkable how quickly your body relearns. I was thinking about this a lot when we heard the paper on muscle memory. And I, w I kept thinking a lot about how you don't quite have it yet the first day of winter, just like you don't quite have your bike legs the first day of spring, but there's a way in which your body reorients around it. And, and so a lot of my thinking has been about that. And I haven't actually thought about the minor gesture in those terms, mostly because um, I don't think of the minor gesture as something you can do. I think of it more as something that, that is, is um, available for modes of attention and, and perception in the world that can be connected to. So an example, the, the, the first example of the minor gesture I had before I started writing about it was, um, it, again, sorry, my examples come from, from the Canadian uh, context, but um, what I call the smell of bread. So that day in the fall when the leaves have changed, I don't know if you've ever tried to see the leaves change, but I've tried every year of my uh, life, and you, you can't actually see that day when it makes the change, but there's a, f there's a quality of a shift that is felt in the air, and, and you can feel it in the way you walk, in the way you move, and so that's what got me started thinking about what are those gestures that orient our experience that, that become part of it. Walking in October is not the same as walking in May. What's the difference there? So anyway. Do you think um, the question of walking and the minor gesture has to do with duration? And that the minor gesture is actually a temporal shift from thinking about step, step, step. This is so slow and boring and nothing's happening to thinking about if you just keep doing it, right? You keep doing it, you cross continents. 
and just as you don't see one, uh, one leaf falling does not make, one swallow does not make a spring, and one fallen maple leaf does not make fall, but all of a sudden, um, over duration, it's there. I have a question about the, I thought, I found so interesting the use of the treadmill as a way of thinking about walking, and I wanted to ask you if you, um, Grisha, if you worked at all, or you thought about the different, the use of the computer on the treadmill, because thinking of the previous panel um, and the idea of how we measure, so it seemed to me there's this interesting difference between the way the computer measures time for you and steps and the way your body measures in your, in your work, which is that you're measuring a completely different form of time and a completely different form of movement, uh, well, distance, all that idea. There's such a disparity between the two, and I think this applies also, Erin, to your work in terms of trying to think about the minor and how to measure differently. So I don't know if you just had any responses to that. No, that's great. Um, one thing I'm thinking a lot because we're thinking about time and movement concurrently is um, in somatic education, in somatic practice, um, they say that the body is the subconscious. Like the body takes up the space of the subconscious er, or I guess what you'd call a shadow time. But they, there was someone else who talked about um, the knowing something the half second before the mind knows it or something, or the intellect knows it, yeah. But um, mm, the body, well, how can I say it? The body is slow, slower than your, it, it, it's like the earth. <laughs> That's how I think about it. I think of body as more as land and less as, I don't know, subject or something. So, um, so I like, I like a lot of juxtaposition, like I like a lot of like things banging up against each other. And so we worked, I mean, the thing is, the funny thing is, is that I work with dance and in a kind of dance has all this language and all this legibility and all this way that it's made and read and history and context and all that kind of thing and, and bodies, you know, like that's the biggest thing. So. There's all this kind of realm to like m mess around in, but computation and digital media is its own, uh, yeah, so so we hacked, and I mean, we we are in a maker space, you know what I mean? So we hack into treadmills, and so we say, what is in this motherboard, and how does, how do you quantify, like what is, what is counting the steps mean to that? to the treadmill, do you see what I'm saying? And they say, oh, okay, well, yeah, that's interesting. No, that's not interesting. Yes, we want to modify it. No, we, we want to open it up. So thinking about how the treadmill uh, essentially tracks the mover, be it a dancer mover or a public mover in the, in the installation side was really complicated. Super complicated, and it, and and what we were going to use in inside the, the the affordances of the treadmill, which we would use and which we would n discard, was also something that we had to think about. And so, what we ended up doing, as it turns out, is putting it was listening, and that was the solution. There are sensors that, are like induction mics, that you can put underneath your treadmill and listen to the people move on the treadmill. And that's how we count it. And so say, okay, there's a good, whatever, interstitial kind of like <laughs> sensory interlocutor. You know what I'm saying? So it's cool. And then we have digital signal and then we can turn it back into some organic mess of a sound, you know what I mean, or lights. So, so you have all this like controller and controlling, but treadmills are also cool because they're so ugly, everybody hates them, you know, and everybody thinks they're terrible, not like MacBooks, you know what I mean? So everybody loves them. So it's, it, <laughs> it makes it kind of like mm, a interesting thing, especially in the world of dance and technology, because usually when you talk about live art and technology, you think about nice technology. You don't think about washing machines and treadmills and, you know, just old, old, old technology or something. Or you think of Namjoon Pai, or whatever you think about t television. Yeah. Okay. Should I respond quickly to that as well? Um, 
So time is definitely something that I've been thinking about and, and working with, um, mostly since I have, a, since I've been in an academic position and have lost time, um, and uh, <laughs> and um, I've been thinking a lot about the precarity, the problem of precarity, the people who have money but no time, the people who have no money but time, but then they don't really have time because they don't have the money, so they have to find the, you know, you know the problem. And, um, and I've been thinking a lot about the neoliberalization of the university and the ways in which um, the university um, values our time, uh, literally, through um, submitting our constant achievements and measuring ourselves according to those achievements. And, um, and that was really the background of this particular work that would take something that is machine-made, um, ubiquitous, um, and give the time that I don't have to it. This today was the first day that I asked other people to, to pull threads. Um, and, and to ask what it is that that time commitment can do that where the time doesn't actually exist. But the, the other question that you asked is maybe the one that's closest to my heart and I know uh, per collaborators here in the room that we're trying to build a, an alternative a free university. We're trying to create something different. And a lot of us um, in, I'm sure many people here who are activists or who are trying to um, figure out how to live in this world um, are really tired. There's a lot of exhaustion, there's a lot of burnout. And uh, in, in, the, in the orientation toward trying to invent something new, it seemed to me that we needed to have a new account of value. So that maybe spending a year pulling threads could invent its own kind of value. And, um, and maybe there could be a rehabilitation of the minor um, because we do live in a, in a, in a, in a society of the grand. Um, and I know, I mean, I, I, when I, in, in my book I talk about this in terms of the indigenous um, First Nations of Canada and the incredible wealth of minor gestures that are part of indigenous culture and the constant um, overcoding of those minor gestures by the grand gestures of reconciliation that means nothing or, or whatever. So anyway, that's, so the question of value is really key for me. Ms. Coleman, I would like to know what's your opinion on these new treadmills that give you this virtual reality? Yeah, I mean, I, I tried them. <laughs> you know, I tried them. I, so we, we think about it all the time because I have a really big team of, oh, sorry, sorry. I have a deep, big team of people that I work with uh, and that's part of the interesting thing. So Onome called me and said, oh, you know, Grisha, you need to go try the new treadmills because they da-da-da. And, um, you know, we'll have like the, the HCI or the, the computational person try them. We'll have the architect try them. We'll have the um, dancers try them, the lighting de designer try them, and kind of try and tease out the differences between what's, what that is and what that experience is and, and what we're doing. Um, so I think one of the, I mean, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, you know, and it kind of distracts you away from whatever that you're, um, you know, the, the intensity of like, oh yeah, I'm trying to get in shape or something like that, whatever. I mean, I think that um, it's a better step than watching TV, but I think that um, there's a kind of dissociation when you're moving, it's just, it, it gets very complicated when you're, you're using these machines and then you're pretending to be outdoors somewhere, it makes it even more kind of diabolical, even more complicated. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it, 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 it kind of befuddles me, but I, I understand that in the time of like, contemporary time in a, this kind of modernity, it's like, a, it's like the perfect, it's even more, um, it's like even more surreal than what I'm doing. I, like my thing is just like whatever. It's like go walk on those crazy treadmills that take you to somebody because somehow you don't have any touch with, 
I don't know, that, that which is, that which we consider is nature or natural, like you don't have access. That's what it makes me think. It's for people who don't have access. I don't know, have you taken, have you tried it? I've tried all of them, the Great, ca the Grand Canyon, yeah. the, <laughs> you, you name it, I just go so wild like and I'm experiencing everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, and yes, you enjoyed it? Did it make the run better or the walk better? Actually, it takes you to another place in your mind mm. where you don't even realize that mm. you're on this thing for at least an hour because mm. I get so caught up in you know the yeah. minutia of the scenery and everything uh, else. The yeah. time just flies. Yeah, that's amazing. You see. So, that's amazing. So I guess it serves its purpose yes. somewhat. Yes, serves its yeah. purpose. Yes. Yeah. And Ms. Manning, I have a question for you. Why did you put circles in the cloth as opposed to some other geometric shape? <laughs> yeah, this is um, a work in process. Um, it's actually a garment for multiple bodies, so you can climb into it and, and make, a, make a garment. It's just small enough that it can work for one person. So the, the size is, uh, anything bigger than that I think would be too much material for one body. So you can design a garment with it, or you can design more than one garment with it. So it's part of a, a collection. Most of my work has some relationship to designing a, 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 a wearable collection. So many provocations and so little time. Um, we, we've, uh, we've run out of ours. And I just want to um, thank our artists and respond one more time. And thank you all for coming for this lovely day.